because they are so cold that uh, the frost has been uh, bit up. We're looking here at the grey um, mast, uh, the big grey metal mast. It's called the umbilical mast, the KZM. It's connecting the teams on the ground to the satellite steer, isn't it? Yes, that's right. It's our link. It's how, it's how we're seeing all the umbilical lines, but as you have heard now, uh, we have received information that the umbilical lines have, have been uh, completely disconnected and so the top of command uh, has been sent. So uh, the lines have been disconnected. Um, we can't actually see them being disconnected because they're inside the mask. Yes, but the main information is that now we have no longer uh, information coming from the satellites. and. Uh, uh, They're now disconnected. Yes. And, and that mast is going to retract just before launch, about 30 seconds or so before launch, so do watch out for that. Uh, you'll see that retract, and then the other thing you'll see below it is another mast, the VKM, um, and that's um, the lower stage mast. Yes, but it is a fully other kind of mast uh, which is connected to the equipment bay of the Block A, the second stage, and it houses all the electrical links uh, providing communications between uh, ground and the Block A. As you say, the Block A is uh, the second stage. Now we're coming up to the one-minute mark. Um, let's just talk a little bit um, about the ignition sequence in a second. The uh, range operations manager is getting ready to call out the one-minute mark. One minute to launch. Let's just fly through the ignition sequence here. It's a little bit different uh, from Ariane. We have uh, uh, first a low thrust level, then intermediate, and then full. What's that about? Yes, exactly. The, uh, all the engines on the four boosters and on the course edge will be ignited at the same time. Uh, as soon as the launch command will be sent on 20 seconds before the, la the, the launch. And uh, they initially operate at a low level. And afterwards, you will have... Du ah, we have and the that goes the KZM mast. Yes. Bang on time. So everything is nominal until now. And uh, finally, uh, after... Pour le de la de Beginning of the, yes. um, the ignition sequence. <laughs> right, okay. everybody, we shall let you Alors, watch the launch. Um, best wishes to everyone. Du triétage. Attention pour le décompte final. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Top. Décollage. Always spectacular. We're yeah, off. <laughs> <laughs> Heading out over the Atlantic Ocean. We're burning five engines, one on the core stage and four on the boosters. The boosters, though, are the ones that are doing all the work here because their job is just to haul us against the gravity of the earth. Tell us about them. Yeah, the boosters are providing 80% uh, of the, the thrust now, right now. There are four identical conical shaped boosters strapped to the second stage. And the uh, RDA 107A engine uh, is powered by the liquid oxygen and kerosene. That's the same propellant used for the, the three main stages of the Soyuz. And each engine has four combustion chambers and nozzles. And we're getting some spectacular images here as we uh, fly through the Earth's atmosphere. We can see there the, uh, the trace of uh, the propellant. We are very lucky because we have uh, a daylight launch and we can see it uh, until uh, very high in the sky. And if we're really lucky, we might get to actually see those boosters um, falling away in real life. So the uh, launcher is sending us telemetry signals. Um, and uh, here we go. We're getting the uh, booster cut off. And we can actually see them. Those four dots on the screen. There yes. they go. <laughs> Flying <laughs> away. The four boosters. Heading back down to Earth. So uh, tell us what we're looking at on the left-hand side of the screen. Tim. Yes, on the left uh, side of the screen, you have, uh, in fact, the uh, predicted uh, trajectory profile. And you have the, the, dot, the dot on the curve, which is the actual position of the launch vehicle. 
Les the paramètres A, bord sont normaux. Everything is nominal on board, so good news. And the A stands for the altitude, so we are, the, we are now at the 68 km, and the V for speed. And we're now burning the main core stage, uh, or the block A, and that burns for just under five minutes. Yes, the block A is... La production uh, est normal. Everything is normal. Uh, the, the, the block A is a hammerhead uh, shape uh, to, to accommodate the, the boosters. It's composed of two hedge tanks of propellant, LOX and Kerosene, and the propulsion is provided by the RDA 108A engine. You have, already, you have uh, as for the boosters, four combustion chambers uh, along with uh, four vernier thrusters. And uh, the fairing uh, we're looking at here at the top of the vehicle, it's got the satellites inside and it's protecting them from the rigors of the launch, isn't it? Yeah, it protects the satellites from external environment first on ground, once the satellites are encapsulated, and then during flight, protecting them from different fluxes and aerodynamic uh, pressure and heating with dense atmosphere. As soon as the aerothermal flux becomes lower than satellite acceptable value, the fairing is shit on. And of course we are flying through the, the dense atmosphere of the Earth, which is roughly about 100 kilometers thick, and as we get to the outside of the atmosphere, the friction is reduced, and uh, the satellites are, are able to bear it. So we're now having the predicted images there of uh, the uh, separation of the fairing. We don't need it anymore because we don't have much friction left anymore. Um, uh, Thierry, with the, the images that we're seeing, we can still see them down here on the bottom left-hand side of the screen. Um, we, it, these are images which actually you created right from the start, aren't they? They're simulated images of what we're actually, uh, is actually happening? Yes, uh, you know, in fact, uh, I was at the origin of this uh, 3D dimension simulation program, and uh, all the 3D images uh, that you see are simulated ones, but all the movements and positions are based on exact nominal prediction of the launch. So all the parameters are normal. Good news. Uh, there is today no correlation with real telemetry uh, coming from the launcher, but one day, perhaps, I hope that uh, we will get it. That would be good. <laughs> so what we're looking at here is uh, the uh, second stage, the block A, the third stage with a latticework connection in the middle and the satellites there exposed uh, to space, and we're now getting the prediction of um, the second stage separation. Um, <clears throat> we're seeing all these milestones happening at the right time, but uh, we get the actual confirmations slightly later, and that's perfectly normal. It takes a little time for the information to get to the range operations manager, and then, of course, he'll, he'll call out the confirmations when he gets them. So what are we looking at here? It's a peculiarity of Soyuz, isn't it, the way the engines are ignited? Separation du bloc A. Ah, we received the confirmation of the separation, which is fully nominal. Uh, yes, uh, you're right, with, uh, with RN we spread one stage before an ignition. Next, uh, with Soyuz there is a specificity with the third stage ignition. It starts approximately two seconds before the previous stage shutdown. And uh, the thrust from the third stage engine at ignition helps to push the second stage away. And uh, the second and third stage, they are linked by a lattice work structure to help uh, evacuate and enable us to ignite the engine before separation. And that was the structure we could see uh, linking the two stages. And uh, how do we separate them? How does it work? Yeah, we use pyrotechnic locks and spring pushers to push the stage away. So we're now burning the third stage. It burns for about four and a half minutes. What's our speed and altitude? Now the altitude is uh, roughly at 175 km and the uh, speed velocity at uh, 4.47 km per second. And we're looking here at the uh, uh, frigate is the gold section, that's the upper stage, and the satellites attached. Uh, this is the seventh launch so far this year from the Guiana Space Center and we're preparing three more. It's been a busy time. IM-5 sets another record, the 54th successful launch in a row. On the 28th of September, it orbited two satellites, Astra 2 for the Luxembourg operator SES and g Saturn for the Indian Space Research Organization. During the 63rd International Astronautical Congress in Naples in October, Ariane Space reaffirmed its position as the world's benchmark launch service provider and a partner to Italian space industry. Italy plays an important role in the launch family as well as building satellites. Activities at the CG are scaling up. On the 9th of October, the next Ariane 5 was transferred to the final assembly building to launch Vitelsat 21B and Star 1C3 on the 9th of November. 
the fourth automated transfer vehicle, otherwise known as Albert Einstein, is undergoing preparations. Europe's cargo ship is due for launch to the International Space Station in April 2013. Activities for the fourth Soyuz launch from the CSG have started, and this week preparations are taking place on the frigate Blue Stage to launch the second Pleiad satellite on the 30th of November. And activities for Vega's second launch under the VERTA program are to start at the end of November with the transfer of the P-80 first stage to the launch zone. So, our flight path takes us from Kourou out across the Atlantic, across Europe, Russia. Everything's going according to plan. Uh, Southeast Asia and down towards Australia, and we're tracking the launcher using ground stations as it flies over. We call this telemetry. Yeah, Soyuz sends, in fact, uh, data to those ground tracking stations, and uh, it tells us, us how the flight is progressing uh, in real time by giving uh, many interesting inf information. He's saying that everything's going well. Um, now, the tracking stations are on this flight, uh, well, Galio in Kourou. Then we have um, a boat in the Atlantic co uh, called SNA. Then in the Azores, we have Santa Maria. The Azores are islands, which are about 100 kilometers off the west coast of Portugal in, in the middle of the Atlantic. And then we pick up the signal in Toulouse in France at uh, Asaguel. Asaguel. Osaguel. Osaguel. Yes. <laughs> Uh, then we lose visibility uh, for a little while. Yes, and then uh, we'll have a berth on the southwest uh, coast of Australia and two additional uh, ground tracking stations, um, Dongara and Kerguelen, but uh, which will be used by the on customer side. So some of our ground stations are used by the launcher team and some by the Galileo team. So what's our speed and altitude? Here we go. Look, we are getting the uh, prediction here of uh, separation. Uh, of the third stage, uh, third stage. Now we've had the announcement there. So, uh, so we have the confirmation. We've got the there. confirmation. Uh, extinction of the engine and separation. So we're now beginning the next phase of the journey. Now the gold structure you're looking at there is frigate. It's the upper stage. What's it actually doing? Yes, in fact, uh, Frigate the first stage uh, is preparing uh, the ignition of its main propulsion systems by uh, activating the 55-second uh, attitude control system longitudinal acceleration, which ensures that the propellant will be well positioned on the bottom of the tanks. So uh, this ensures the proper ignition, and it's a little bit like, I suppose, if you um, put your foot on the accelerator in the car and you're, you go back into the seat. Um, here we are now. Uh, getting frigate's main engine first ignition burn. It burns for over 13 minutes. And uh, frigate's job is to deliver the satellites to their separation orbit. And that'll take uh, about 3 hours and 40 minutes. Thierry, it's a, it's, it's a vehicle in its own right, isn't it? It was actually designed as an interplanetary space probe. Yes, you're right. And Peola Voshkin uh, created many interplanetary probes in the past. And the Frigate upper stage follows all uh, these design traditions. This is a fully autonomous stage with few, with flu, which flew for the first time in 2000. And it, it can be restarted uh, multiple times, in fact, uh, 20 times. And it has its own OBC on board computer with uh, guidance, navigation and control systems, uh, as well as uh, tracking and telemetry systems. Now we are at a speed of uh, yes, 7.4 km per second and an altitude of 163 km. So far, all the parameters are normal. Galileo is a European endeavor, and it's the first to co concrete project between ESA and the European Commission. We launch now two more satellites of the Galileo constellation. So today, we will have four satellites, and we will continue. Next year, we will launch four satellites every six months. By end of 2014, early 2015, we will have around 18 to 24 satellites of the Galileo constellation. And we will be able to start the services offered by this great European project. These services will be useful for transportation, 
fishing, agriculture, civil protection, public health. This is why it is so important to go forward. This is why it is necessary to support this great project. We have planned in the next financial perspectives to have a specific budget, but we are also saving a lot of money. And if we are able to stick to this timing, we will save more money. Before end of 2020, we will have the final constellation, so it will be a big European dream that will become a great reality and will help all citizens. So an important project for all of us, and here we're looking at the Galileo team in mission control. Left-hand side of the screen is uh, giving us information on our mission. Uh, talk us uh, through where we are now, Thierry. Yes, in fact, um, so we have an altitude of uh, 150 kilometers and a speed of uh, 707 kilometers per second. So far, all parameters are normal. You can see on the bottom left uh, this three-dimension three simulation, which shows that uh, the burning is in progress. And uh, on the top, on the left side, uh, you can see the trajectory profile, which is, uh, I recall it, uh, a predicted trajectory profile with a dot. Now, the French Space Agency, CNES, has been very involved in the development of satellite navigation in Europe. From the very start, the IGNOS program and Galileo have been of extreme importance to France. Going back to the 90s, CNES was at the origin of the European EGNO system and of the Galileo architecture. It was in Toulouse that CNES set up the EGNOS Performance Evaluation Center. And CNES also made a major contribution to the design of the navigation signals and messages. CNES with the patents and also the frequencies with the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union. All that was then transferred to ESA and then the European Union. Moreover, it was France and the UK that gave the European Union the Galileo Security Monitoring Center. France, which together the US, Russia and Canada, was one of the founding members of COSPAR SARSAT, the Search and Rescue System, persuaded the European Union to connect the Galileo satellites to COSPAR SARSAT. Thus, allowing Galileo to contribute to the saving of 30,000 human lives in 30 years. At the conclusion, the launch of these two additional satellites proved that Galileo is becoming a tangible reality and one of which all European citizens can be proud. So as we said, um, this is the third launch of a Soyuz from the Guiana Space Center uh, and there are several different configurations of the Soyuz launches bit like a car. If you're a BMW owner, then you'll know about the 3 Series, the 4 Series, the 5 Series. And here at CSG, we're effectively using the Soyuz 2 Series. Interesting image, yes. <laughs> uh, there are two versions of that. The Soyuz STA with a forget them upper stage and a Soyuz STB with a forget them T upper stage that we are using today. Uh, they are similar to the ones using Baikonur, um, which are called the Soyuz 21A and Soyuz 21B, but we have adapted them slightly uh, for the uh, CSG environment. And the main adaptation is the KISO safety kit implementation and telemetry system. So, same vehicle on a new pad. The Soyuz ST launch vehicle has been developed and is being produced at the Samara Space Center, one of the main participants of the Soyuz at Guyana Space Center project. The Soyuz ST carrier has been chosen to implement the project. Launch vehicles of the Soyuz family are descendants of the famous Semyorka, which 50 years ago performed the first manned flight with cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin on board.
Carriers of Soyuz family have optimum design, fine-tuned manufacturing technique, highly qualified and professional employees, and efficient quality control system applicable to each phase of manufacturing and assembly. The Soyuz ST, produced at the Samara Space Center, is a Soyuz 2 derivative designed for launches from French Guiana. Soyuz 2's stability, maneuverability, highly accurate payload injection, and safety maintenance are the reasons why Soyuz 2 has been chosen as a prototype for the Soyuz ST. To perform launches from a new launching site, the Soyuz ST has been modified to meet European safety requirements concerning the telemetry system and operational conditions. New hardware that enables the carrier engines to be cut off from the ground has also been added. In case of emergency, the engines can be cut off manually. And the large size fairing of the ST type, which conforms to international standards, will increase the accommodation area under it. Soyuz ST is delivered from Samara to St. Petersburg in blocks by rail, followed by transportation by sea to French Guiana. Each block is covered and placed into a separate transport container. Some special hermetically sealed containers have been produced to transport the blocks to the equatorial launch site. These containers are to be mounted on platforms on the train and transported 1,500 kilometers to St. Petersburg. And from there, the cargo is taken by sea to French Guiana aboard the ships Calabri and Toucan. Launches from French Guiana will make Soyuz the first carrier in the world that is able to launch from three countries, Plisetsk in Russia, Baikonur in Kazakhstan, and Kourou in Guyana. So we're now flying over Europe. Um, over the tracking station uh, in uh, Toulouse, or Sagel in Toulouse, acquiring the signal there. And if you look at the curve on the left-hand side of the screen, as you can see before, we were using our power to get away from the Earth, and now we're really using it uh, to, to go higher. Yes, exactly. As you can see, uh, we are climbing. Uh, the dot, uh, the dot uh, white uh, on the left uh, shows that uh, it follows a carefully trajectory um, with a spin uh, which is... Uh, which, we, which is uh, relatively constant, I would say, 8.8 .8, uh, kilometers per second. Which is nearly 9 kilometers per second, quite, quite remarkable. Um, Frigate is a very clever piece of kit. Let's find out more about it. Frigate is uh, the upper stage beneath uh, the fairing of uh, the Soyuz launcher that was developed with uh, Emperor Lovishkin back in 1999-2000 for his cluster launch. It is extremely lightweight and uh, fully autonomous thanks to its own engine and uh, guidance system. It can be used as a, an additional stage on the Soyuz launcher. It functions uh, with a cerebral propellant and uh, can be reignited around uh, 20 times. Thanks to Fregat's uh, reignitability, it can reach a range of different orbits. Sun synchronous orbits for Earth observation missions, optical or radar observations, geostationary missions with a measure point at uh, 36 
thousand kilometers long. With payload injection conditions identical to those of Ariane 5, it also allows for medium and high orbit missions such as uh, the launch of the Galileo constellation. Most frigate missions require two ignitions. It can, however, be reignited up to 20 times, which means that relatively complex missions are possible with exchanges of orbital line or orbital altitude. This specific feature was used for the Pleiad ELISA SSOP mission in uh, and 2011, where five different satellites were placed on two different orbits thanks to a total of four firings of the main engine. Frigate is perfect for in-space business as it offers uh, GTO up to 3.1 tons, SSO launches or the launch of constellations such as Galileo or Global Star. So it's a very important, uh, very important vehicle in its own right. And uh, look, we're now travelling at uh, over nine kilometres a second. And as I said earlier, Thierry, these speeds uh, to me are really quite remarkable. Nine kilometres per second. So there's everybody, uh, cool, calm and collected in the mission control, the guests watching there. Um, <clears throat> so Frigate is the... Is the um, the gold section, and uh, it's a circular shape, isn't it? What's it made of? Yeah, uh, it's uh, made of aluminium, and uh, in fact, the MLI, the MLI that you see, uh, all the parameters are nominal. So uh, the, um, the gold, the gold uh, structure that you see is, in fact, the representation of the MLI that is protecting uh, the frigate. And now we are reaching the frigate cutoff. The frigate's getting ready to cut off its engine. There we have the image there of it cutting off its engine, the synthesized uh, images, and uh, it's going into what we now call the ballistic phase, uh, and that lasts three hours and 12 minutes. Um, the ballistic means without propulsion, so we're effectively traveling high enough and fast enough to, to cruise without the engine. We're, we're already in orbit. What's happening now, Thierry? Well, now, um, during this ballistic phase, we'll have uh, 12 minutes of orientation maneuver We'll have 12 minutes of orientation maneuver to point frigate and the satellites to the correct attitude before beginning the barbecue phase. And barbecue phase, e at the end of this barbecue phase, we'll have a 13 minutes of orientation maneuver to prepare the second boost. And the barbecue phase, uh, there we have the confirmation of yes. the engine cutoff. And the barbecue phase is a little bit like roasting on a spit. <laughs> yes, yes, right. And in fact, uh, it allows to ensure like this uh, the homogeneity of thermal conditions around the satellites and it keeps the temperature even. So we're flying over Eastern Europe. Um, we will start to lose the telemetry signal from the launcher uh, shortly. We're waiting for Mr. Lugal now to come up and... Um, Tell us what's going to happen next. Um, we will be um, taking a break in our programming and coming back to you later, but let's listen to Mr. Legal. Well, as you have just seen, the first part of the mission went uh, smoothly. The Soyuz tri-stage worked perfectly. After this, we had separation of the upper part of the launcher, in other words, the frigate stage, and both of the Galileo satellites. After that, as you've seen, we had the first burn of frigate, and uh, we're now just over the Baltic Sea, after which uh, we'll come down over Asia. We'll be going quite close to uh, Baikonur, so we'll probably be able to wave as we go by. Then over Indonesia, the Indian Ocean, and in a little more than three hours, Frigate and the two satellites will be above the south of Australia, where there'll be a second ignition of Frigate, which will be shorter than the first, and separation of the spacecraft. So that's what I can tell you for the time being. And for those people who are following the video transmission, stay with us for the end of the mission in a little over three hours. Thank you. So, as Jean-Yves Vigal said, we'll be coming back to you um, 
at uh, 21.22 GMT, that's 23.22 Central European Time, and 6.22 here in French Guiana. So uh, let me just repeat that, uh, 9.22 GMT. Um, And we'll be joining our satellites 28 minutes before Frigate's second burn. Frigate will be getting ready at that point to uh, switch on its engines. Uh, So we'll have plenty of time to talk more about our mission, uh, the Galileo constellation. And uh, joining us to do that will be Marco Falcone, who's from the European Space Agency. He'll be coming into the commentary box to join Thierry and I. In the meantime, uh, let's take a look back at the fantastic launch. It was spectacular. We're very lucky to have a beautiful sunny day. Once more. (laughs) And again, a very wonderful launch, actually, Uh, because we were expecting... uh, we were expecting Soyuz to hide behind the clouds, but uh, no, we we actually saw the boosters separate in in real time, which was... uh, really quite spectacular. So, our satellites are in-orbit validation Galileo satellites. FM3 and FM4 are now on their journey, on en route uh, to their injection orbit. We'll see you again in just over three hours.